Welcome to Multiple Offers, a real estate show with competing perspectives. Today we are talking about leaky condos. Put that coffee down. If you're good at something, never do it for free. How'd you get the gig? Oh, you know, they were hiring. It was only a two-week course. I will sell this house today. What are you, some kind of real estate agent? Ah, oh, he's a realtor. There is a difference somehow. This is Multiple Offers, a real estate show. All right, guys, it is episode 41, not to be confused by Matt's title of episode 42, if you're watching this live. Did I call it 42 in my written title? Oh, yes, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I really think it's 42 today. Yeah. I I had a bit of exciting news from probably our biggest fan. Uh, Sam Sam sent me a text. Sam is our biggest fan. Sam. I think Sam's Sam, my biggest fan. Sam, well, Sam was your biggest fan. He watched our first live broadcast and he was very confused you know how people don't always sound exactly the way they look oh (laughs) yeah he decided he likes he likes matt better now that he's seen him than he originally did because he's huge in the video yeah maybe maybe because he's huge (laughs) like i didn't realize jared was so small (laughs) oh because of the forced perspective on you were in the corner no way puts jared in the corner i'm in the corner yeah and um and then there was a lot of banter yeah, back and forth, and and he didn't realize until Liz jumped in and commented on something that he went to high school with Liz. So then he got really excited that there's like <laughs> six degrees of Kevin Bacon to Matt Damon or to Matt Brabens. <laughs> yeah, so. well, that's kind of awesome. Yeah, uh, so that's why he liked me is not because he saw me because he saw that I'm married. I'm married into New West. Um, that might have something to do with it. He <laughs> took bass lessons at Neil Doug's oh, guitar mm-hmm. shop. Neil Doug's guitar shop. Yeah. So he saw he's part of the uh, the yeah. everybody in New West took lessons there. Yeah, and so, that was his comment of like, "Oh man, New West is even smaller." He's <laughs> moved away. <laughs> so, so I'm accepting new fans now. If you're if you're listening, okay, um, got a limit of one. So, but they got to be hardcore. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm still. Uh, Messing around with my Facebook stuff, so you guys can. Uh, well, I guess we're we're moving along here. We are moving along. Thanks, okay. Facebook. Yeah. All right. Uh, I, I wanted to mention something that's been going on uh, that I, I posted on one of our social media channels is that we're the New West guys. Uh, okay. But last week, for a very short time, we were the North Van guys. Oh. I thought we weren't going to talk about that. Well, I think it's worth being transparent. You did a deal in North Van. Did a deal in North Van. Yep. That's two bridges. One bridge. A tunnel and a bridge. <laughs> How long did it take you to get there? How often do you leave New West? <laughs> what, what tunnel did you go through? Um, well, what is it? Arthur Lang Tunnel? Is that a th- Wow, let's not do geogra- geography. You're talking about the Cassiar Connector? Cassiar Tunnel. That's not really an underground tunnel. It's just... Well, it's a tunnel. You right. can hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> if you really felt like it. So one bridge, one tunnel, and you made it to the North Shore. What's it like over there? It was great. Yeah? Yeah. It's a great environment. I mean, like I said in our posts in the social media, the guy started in New West. He really liked New West. Mm-hmm. Saw a place he really liked. But he's got more family and stuff in North Van. And uh, the budget ended up working out in North Van. So there he was. So we started out in New West. And sometimes the New West guys do have to leave town. A little field trip. And that's okay. Huh. Did you feel like you were cheating? Well, it's a little bit incongruent with the team name, but we got we do what's right for the client, what's right for the environment of what's going on, and, and we were we were moving around for a few different places for this buyer, and we represented him well, and I'm happy with how it all went. But uh, like I said, Jerry, like to be transparent, you yeah. know, they can't all be in New West. There's usually one or two that are outside. <laughs> Just kind of works out that way sometimes. Yeah. Hmm. What's going on with you, Jeff? I told you. Sa- I, I got the Sam news. The Sam, that that the was Sam. the big. That sounds kind of like Sam fan. What's going on with me? Okay. Um, <laughs> well, what what is going on? I oh, I felt like such an idiot yesterday. I um, so I haven't been able to go to the gym because uh, Rach is uh, having to do early doctor's appointments. So I'm I'm solo dad in the mornings right now, hmm. and so I decided I'd I'd work on my eating as part of my quest to be a less substantial realtor instead of working out so much. And I thought I'd, I had a whole bunch of people tell me that I should give keto a try. So uh, plan number one was dinner last night. And I took my fresh prep and I, I threw out the rice and I threw out the sugar as part of the meal plan. 
what I didn't do was throw out the tiny little ghost pepper. And I chopped it all up. And Jer often has talked to me about wearing gloves while cooking, but I, yeah. I did not. And I must have scratched my nose at some point <laughs> while I was cooking. And like midway through the stir fry, I started to feel like a little burning. Mm-hmm. And it got worse and worse and worse to the point that instead of eating dinner, I was Googling how to stop burning from getting <laughs> pepper in your nose. Um, on the internet, I found use vinegar. And I also found use milk. I found pouring vinegar down my nose did nothing, um, but milk actually did. So I, I had like a big paper towel and was just holding <laughs> my nose, and it it burned for forty five minutes. Yeah, ghost ghost peppers are no joke. Yeah, it. I was in a lot of pain, and even after you wash your like, yeah, I'll, I'll you know you wash your hands after afterwards, um, it'll still like you know just one little wipe. Yeah, I've got a niche. I'm gonna give it a wipe, and it'll it'll just sit there and, and linger. So you felt this pain as well? Not ghost peppers, just even just jalapenos or something. Right, it'll, it'll yeah. still like the oils will stay stay on your fingers. So yeah, so I felt really stupid. So that's a good pro tip, <laughs> and and not the greatest start to my my keto journey. I don't think. Yeah, it's a tough start. Yeah. Okay, well today we're gonna talk wiki condos. Yeah, uh, I'll do a little quick news segment. We'll talk about what's new. In the real estate world, and uh, let's tell people why they really need to know about Wiki Condo still today. I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story, and I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. I got a news flash for you, Walter Cronkite. I am enlightened. Do it live! I can all write it, and we'll do it live. This is Multiple Offers, a real estate show. All right, we are going to be brief with the news today, but I think a lot of people have seen that the headlines, as we get every start of every month, is mm-hmm. stats from the previous month. And we don't want to belabor stats, but what it is saying is it's repeating what we've already talked about on the show before, is sales volume numbers are the lowest in years. That's a big, scary headline. Yeah, it makes it sound like everything's falling apart, right? Uh, and then as we were talking about it yesterday, things sales volume is down. We're noticing different trends in different communities. And we've talked about it before. We feel like uh, Vancouver proper gets hit a lot harder because the price tags are a lot higher. But when we look at the stats in New West, for New West condos specifically that fit regional incomes, those numbers look pretty good. Yeah, they, they I mean, they're obviously the number of sales isn't great, but the... Stuff is stuff is moving along again. I, I can't remember. I don't have it in front of me, but the the actual sales ratios were decent. You guys were going through it the other day, right? For condos, they're they're still okay. Yeah, houses are still tough, but the houses are. And I, yeah, I don't I don't know. It seems like the condos are even up to like seven hundred or so. They're still still selling, um, but the houses, I just I don't know. I don't see the affordability unless we have you know people coming from overseas or Vancouver. or someone with with money and if i guess if their places aren't selling in vancouver then yeah. they're not going to be buying the the 1.3 1.5 and and up house here so it'll be interesting to see if we still see pressure on the prices for houses yeah we'll see so that's really the news story is that they've told everybody that sales volume is way down mm-hmm. uh, but when we look at it a little more closely we notice that buyers are interested they're interested at the right price so the numbers could start to look a little bit better uh, it's also a bit skewed because when they say sales numbers are way down, they're comparing it to January of last year. Right. And when we did our 2018 A Stats Odyssey, we did comment on how January was very, very aggressive yeah, last that, year. that's an outlier. Like, that is not a normal January. So trying to compare to that year. January yeah. skews the numbers even further, hmm. right? So I, I feel like when we actually look at it through just a, a relative lens, it felt like a pretty good January. Yeah. I mean, considering the softness of the market. It feels like activity has picked up. And and I don't know if you guys are seeing the same thing, but number of calls on, on listings has definitely picked up. Um, is that what you guys are finding on your stuff as well? Uh, the, ones, the ones that we have, are they're not brand new listings, so it's, it's always a bit hard to gauge unless you've got something that's just hit. I would still say that they're getting more activity, and the activity we're getting is more serious and more sincere. Yeah. You know, people are ready to take action. Again, if the price is right. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I had in the first two weeks of January, more calls on a townhouse I've gotten Poco than I had in November and December total on, on the place. Um, and it did sell now. Um, 
So, I mean, those calls turned into stuff. And, I mean, December was dead, dead, dead. Like, nobody was calling on it whatsoever. Yeah, yeah which, so it's all is, coming together. Yeah, normal December stuff for sure. So that's the news. Well, should we... Now, we're going to change it up a little bit today. Oh, yeah. Good thing you said that. Yeah, because I, I think we're going to tell a little story. Let's do it. It's story time with Jer. Great story. Compelling and rich. It's not always my story? No, it's not always your story. What if Matt has an awesome story to tell? Well, he can tell it to me or write it down and I will <laughs> paraphrase. This is Multiple Offers, a real estate show. Come on back, Jeff. You got a story for us. Well, and I, I think you guys will be able to jump in and, and participate in this story because we all know about this. But it, we thought it was maybe a good idea to jump into this this week, change the order up a little bit because it really highlights why leaky condos are still a problem. Um, so there is a building in New West, and we won't say its name or its address, um, mostly because owners in that building are constantly threatening realtors with uh, lawsuits. Well, we get that from a number of I know we get that from a number of buildings when we we give our our honest opinion that we think it's a high risk building. Yes, and there are a number of them in New West. Yeah, uh, and this story can apply to many buildings that are similar, but it just it follows a trajectory that allows us to expand on all elements of why leaky condos are still a talking point. Yes. And so. also to answer the main question, if they still exist, are they still a problem? Um, they, they're they still ones that, that are out there that, that haven't been resolved, even though this is something that was highlighted. They knew about it you know, a long, long time ago, and it's still still out there. Yeah. So to your point, Jeff, yeah, a lot of the owners don't like that we had, have never liked that we had this to say, but we've been saying it for yeah. over 10 years. And your job as an agent is to look out for your client's best interest. And if your client is a buyer, they need to know that a building may be higher risk. Yes. than other buildings. So we have a building. It's a low rise. It's stucco. It's got no overhangs. And it has tiny little amounts of work that's been done to the walls. Yeah, they've rain, the they rain screened little portions here and there. Yeah, there, there are sections of rain that have been rain screened. And that can be quite deceiving because I don't know about you guys, but one of the things I always tell buyers is to look out for flashing on 90s or 80s buildings because they didn't do that on on those buildings originally. And if you see, so for our, view, or for our listeners, if you don't know what flashing is, it's those strips that run between the floors. And that's part of a rain screen system. It's not the entire thing, but it, it's meant to, water comes in the building. Yeah, let's break this down after yeah. we yeah. kind of get through story well, time. Well, I, w- I want to get to the point, yeah. though, of, um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about what flashing is. But th- this building has flashing that you can see on it, but they have not rain screened the entire building maybe we should what's the best way to talk about this building um i guess i'm getting a little lost in where to where to actually begin yeah where where i think it starts is that we understand and we're going to come into this after we f- we finish telling this specific story is we don't understand the construction methodology that meets the characteristics of a leaky condo yes and this building checks the boxes all of them it could be low risk no risk, medium risk, or high risk, but it meets the the characteristics, right? And then the next phase is, so over the number of years, we've wondered about the status of this building, and we say, well, it is risky. That's what we say to our clients. In years before depreciation reports and before they would do envelope reports, we had to rely on our own knowledge, expertise, intuition, and property inspectors. But what we know is some other warning signs are there, like Jeff is saying, that it has some portions of the wall that have been addressed where the stucco has been removed and it's been rain screened to meet today's standard for uh, ensuring that it's not going to be a leaky condo. But it's only some of the walls. And they were always, yeah, the mindset that, okay, this one little section had a problem. Let's fix it. Oh, okay. And then a couple of years later, and we see it's, it's kind of one I'll take people, if I'm on a buyer tour and it's something that's, that maybe something came up and you're like, well, this is why I'm not really taking you here and we'll go drive by. And you're like, you can actually see where the, the cladding, the, the stucco is just buckling and crumbling. And it seems almost every year or two, uh, you know, a chunk falls off and breaks and they've, they've just kind of piecemealed it together and, and put, you know, done one repair. Uh, yeah, so they were doing their spot repairs, right? So that was the other part of it. One more thing, and we're going to elaborate on that, Jared, but the other warning sign that you couldn't see from the outside is that we knew they had moisture signs on the inside as well. Yeah, in this building, I think all of us have had firsthand reports of owners 
who have moisture problems on the inside. Yeah, so that's the other warning sign. So then then the other part is that we do want to rely on professional reports. And then the depreciation report era came in, and they have some reports in this building. And I always sort of throw out the quotations of, this report reads well, quote unquote. Yeah. What does that mean? So they got somebody to come in, and we, we talked about depreciation reports before, where it didn't even... even you know, it needs you to be a qualified person, but it, it could be just, a, you know, basically like a capital, um, capital, sorry, reserve fund study. It could be an engineer that comes in. There's all these different varying. I mean, my strata has like a, the handyman contractor guy came in and created this report for us. So they're, they're all over the map, but they, they, I guess they found somebody that, that did one. Uh, I'm not sure the firm that did it, but, um, they were, there was no, no mention of having any water ingress issues, anything like that. I had an out-of-town realtor call me two weeks ago asking about this building, being like, you know, I read through the documents, and am I wrong, or should I be telling my clients to run screaming? (laughs) (laughs) And they were considering my listing or or this one, and I I was like, no, you should definitely come to my listing. Yeah, so so this report doesn't say that a full building envelope replacement is going to be required. It says that your monitoring and your piece by piece work is sufficient. Yeah. Um, but what we see is is clearly that as as multiple sections keep happening, there's a systemic issue. Yes. And if it keeps happening to all these different wall assemblies, it's likely that all the rest of the wall assemblies are going to need this remedy. And that's really the crux of it. Yeah, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. Yeah, could I think be that... some form of duck. That's true, like ninety five percent of the time. I think in the we'll get into a, a couple situations where it actually does make sense to only do portions, but that is very rare. Yeah, so this is one of those situations where we could look at and say systemically, you're going to need it everywhere. The owners they see a positive report, they sort of live there, they exist with it, and they say, well, we think it's working, and that's why they would be upset with us for saying that it's not sufficient. But it's blacklisted for us. Yeah, but we're telling our clients like, hey, you run a high risk that if this needs the full repair around it, yeah, you're gonna come up with an extra thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, right? So that's the high risk. So. All the visible clues were there, and then at some point, the scales tipped, and it was determined at this building that it is a systemic issue, and it's going to need a full envelope replacement. So these warning signs were around for 10 years. We all said it was coming, and it was really a prolonged timeline, but now it's there. It feels like the big bill is coming. And they're one of the last buildings to have... Well, there's still many more out there. We're going to talk about those low, high, medium risk in the that, area that aren't rain screened from that era. But were we right to warn our clients? Oh, I think there were major. Yes. Okay. So yes. Short we were... answer is yes. <laughs> we were right to warn our clients. However, were we right to steer people away from this building five, six years ago, as we all were doing, because prices have exploded since then? Maybe it depends on their financial situation. Because just because your value's gone up and you moved into the building doesn't mean you're going to have 40K. I, I, yeah, I, I think the important thing is to advise people of the, the risks. And there's, there's two risks, in my opinion. There's risk number one, which is you're going to have a 30, 40. I think the bill that's being proposed is actually even bigger than that. Well, yeah, prices are so much and, higher now than, yeah, than they were. Yeah, you're going to have a gigantic bill. But the other thing is, until that issue gets resolved, once it's officially on the table... The banks aren't interested in financing. So if you have to move, you might be in a really hard place. Yep. Yep. That's a really fair point too, right? So in a lot of people, you tell them that's your option. So you could buy this for $100,000 less than a comparable property down the street. Yeah. They'll say, I just, I just don't want the hassle, the risk. The- yeah. And sometimes it's a, it's a dice roll. Like you've got some buildings that they're, you know, amazing floor plans and the value is they have been reduced because of that. Right. And you can roll that dice, say there's no moisture issues in my unit, so I'm okay with that. And I'm getting a fairly good value for this property, for everything it's offering. And if in in the event that they actually do it, and it, maybe it cost me 50 grand, 60, 70, whatever, um, I'm still well within a good value for you know a, a comparable building in, in town. So they're, they might be okay with that. And it might, might not happen. And they could just live there happily, and, and there's no issue until maybe time when they have to sell it. Right. So that's our, our most concise story from start to finish of one that showed the warning signs, sort of did some spot repairs throughout, tried to maintain, tried to maintain. Eventually, it caught up with them, and yeah. the big bill came. And, and as we mentioned, as we went through that story, there are scenarios where that may not happen, where you may be checking the boxes of the building methodology, but it doesn't work. So let's, let's all break that down, and let's talk about leaky condos. Right, now you want to get nuts? Come on. 
Let's get nuts. You decide your own level of involvement. Well, I guess this is a case where we'll have to agree to disagree. I don't agree to that. Neither do I. Wrong. National debt. Wrong. 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 Advocate. Wrong. With that money, Wrong. you lost. Wrong. 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 Very nice words, but happens to be wrong. You're listening to Multiple Offers, a real estate show. All right, let's break it down and let's talk about a little history of the leaky condo crisis. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, and I I think starting with some context of why this is a problem is definitely the place to start. So we've got, well, let's start off by figuring out your high risk eras. Now, tell me if you agree with this. I've, I've had inspectors say mid 80s throughout most of the 90s is is sort of your high-risk time. And there certainly are leaky condos earlier than mid-80s, but that's kind of your your most likely to be a problem. I would agree for the most part. I think one of the biggest things that happened is is it was stylistically a type of building was yep. becoming popular, and it was around that time. So if you had a builder that had, I've got this crazy design that looks awesome in California. Let's let's build one of these here. And, and that could have happened, yeah, I mean, around the late late 80s or so. Yeah, the, I think the earliest one I've seen is 83, personally. Um, but yeah, yeah. That, seems, that seems early, but it, it yeah, is really that one totally, was early. totally possible. Yeah. Yeah. And the 80s ones do exist, you know, yeah. this face-sealed stucco style. Uh, so they certainly exist in that era, uh, but they are such, so much more high probability once you hit 90, 91. Totally. Yeah, yeah, when I think leaky condo, I'm thinking, like Jer said, they were adopting California building styles. Yeah, so and- to draw like a picture for people... Um, it was like a lot of it was con- condominiums and it was these sort of very sort of square, um, you know, no overhangs and things like that. And, and the stucco itself, um, like acrylic kind of stucco that didn't just didn't, didn't breathe very well. And, and go figure it rains more here than in California. So they have all the same deficiencies over there, but the weather doesn't make it yeah. a problem. And I think even like Washington and Oregon, um, I was doing a little bit of research beforehand, and, and apparently, like New Zealand, there's there were some issues when basically this style of construction, this design, sort of aesthetic. Well, New, was, Z- New was Zealand brought. has leaky condo issues. Yeah, they have similar climate to us. Interesting, I didn't know that. Some some areas. Yeah. yeah. So you talked about overhangs, Jared, right? What I noticed in the '80s builds is they tend to have bigger overhangs. You know, they maybe extend out three feet. Some are square too, but it's the cladding is is wood. Or, or, you know, like well, cedar. yeah, then there's a difference there, right? But when you've got the stucco siding, they tend to have overhangs. And a lot of that 90s stuff went for a lot less overhang for a real sort of square look, right? So, uh, and as you mentioned, Jeff, like they don't breathe. Or, yeah, Jerry, yeah. you're saying and that, And hard, right? hardcore, like, membranes. So they want full, they were sealing things almost too much. Yeah, and that really is what the Aviki condo is. Yeah. It's intended to be watertight. Which is confusing. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it that's, it's great as long as it's the way I always describe it. It says this is a great product if it stays 100% watertight. Right. But when is anything ever 100% watertight, you know, a yeah. year or two after construction? So it, it is, like you said, acrylic. So it doesn't allow much breathing. And you get a little crack, any kind of opening where some moisture can get in. And we have consistent, persistent rain, high humidity, and that moisture just keeps going in and it doesn't get a chance to go out. Right. Because the building is supposed to breathe. It just, it just needs to get out of there after it. <laughs> yeah. So what happened is we realized that this moisture keeps going in and it can't get out. Yeah. So it causes rotten mold on the inside of the building. And that was really the big discovery. It was right. like, oh, crap. Like, it's yeah. not like there's water pouring into your home. In <laughs> some cases, there were some, I heard stories of a building in town that had some, actually some water getting into the walls. <laughs> if you have a huge, you know, if you have a huge wall, like a, a high rise, because um, I guess we'll talk about that too, but it's, it's not just, it's not just wood frame. It's, it's potentially high rises. Yeah. Um, yep. The worst case we've heard, and that kind of is reflection you know, reflected in the story that we told, um, like mushrooms growing because there's just so much like dark damp, yeah. um, ness in, in some of the corners near the floors and things where, um, it was a perfect environment for, I haven't personally seen that, but I've, I've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jerry, you mentioned that a high rise can be a leaky condo. I think it can be a common misconception that only the low rise buildings, wood I, frames are leaky condos. I get buyers all the time who say, I want to buy a high rise because I'm safer. We get oh, realtors that put it in the comments, solid concrete building, yeah, like, worry-free, and, 
and because they even even the misconceptions there that it's it's a high rise so it's concrete it's got concrete framing right yeah it's concrete well the the core structure is concrete the floors might be concrete and and your main columns but there are some concrete especially from that era and they still they still make like the San Marino building is concrete and has uh ephus studded exterior walls um Tell our viewers or our viewers. Oh, I guess we do. Our, we do have viewers. If you're tuning in on Facebook, um, tell our listeners what EFIS is. Uh, it, it's just a, a your face sealed cladding where they actually have. I mean, it's it's the opposite. Well, it's basically what the leaky condos part of that was having. Um, it's sealed right on the the face of the studs, so you actually have a studded wall um, and just two couldn't breathe, too sealed up. And it's porous as opposed to some of the concrete buildings. Yeah, well, it's concrete. Just it's a totally different. Yeah, it's yeah, totally, sol- yeah totally solid different. concrete wall is very different than trying yes. to to build a wall and put a waterproofing coating on it with using variety of uh, materials, right? So uh, towers can be leaky condos. We've seen them have uh, full rain screen added after the fact when they were built in the nineties. We've talked about engineers' reports that can read well. It can say, well, you know, we haven't had high moisture readings or anything to that effect, so this building is in good shape. Or different methodologies, the way that engineers investigate these buildings right yeah there's there's a building in town not the building we were talking about before um but a building that's a very problematic building in new west and they had thermal scans done in on their building right when i was first starting to see if the building was cold to see if the building was moist and um that's a horrible way to phrase that (laughs) to see moisture levels and I, I think that's proven over the years to be a much less reliable way than an engineer actually drilling holes and getting in there and really finding out what's going on behind those walls. Yeah. They, there was just one recently that they ended up going for, um, well, we'll get into fixes, but, um, but basically what you want to see is them actually testing. Like you've got north-facing walls, south-facing walls, east-west. They've got you know different exposure depending on the area where it is. Um, you know, different levels of exposure to to rain and and wind and things like that, and different different risks, I guess, of having that moisture water getting into the building. Um, so they'll actually go like a proper firm will come in and actually sample, you know, sample the different cavities, different areas that have been problematic in the past in other buildings where they kind of have an idea of this is where it would show up. Um, but they'll actually go through and cut holes and, and sample and check check for actual moisture levels. So you said a proper firm. What about a proper builder? Just because you've got one reputable builder's name on a building from the 90s, if you're a buyer today. Like Bosa. Like Bosa. Bosa yeah, is a they, high... They made some reputable leakers. builder. That building I was talking about is a Bosa building. And, yeah. and don't get me wrong. Boza is top two, one of my top two favorite builders who builds in the Lower Mainland. But yeah, blindly being like, okay, well, it's a Boza building or an Ani building or whoever the developer is. Every developer from that era has built. Bad yeah, they, they fell for it. It, it was just the they didn't know. It was yeah. it's systemic. It's yeah. not it's not quality quality of build. And what some of these, I mean, it's fairly typical that your Boza is not actually building it technically. You know, you've got, they're the developer for the property, but the actual construction companies, and they can just dissolve that company. Like, oh, that didn't work out well. That company's gone. So he was a home owner. Cool. But, but both of built this. Mm, technically, they didn't. They sort of marketed it, and it was their property. Um, and certainly, they took the profit. But it was another company, and sorry, that company's not around. So, you know, what's your what's your recourse? Um, well, I, I, well, I still think Bosa in the 90s was building with a high standard. They were just using a flawed construction methodology, and everybody was a victim of that. Right? Yeah. I mean, Bosa buildings from the 90s also are just as much victimized by a really poor uh, plumbing supply lines that were used in the 90s that had to be replaced, you know, 12, 15 years into their life. Yeah. So that doesn't make them bulletproof, right? Well, one of the things Bosa did, and I don't know if it's even intentional or not, or if it was just a stylistic choice, Bosa was doing big time overhangs over their windows when they were building in the 90s. And that's really over the years proved to be really good for water resistance. <laughs> uh, yeah, it buys them some time. Yeah. That's for sure. I mean, and that's only one developer's name we're throwing around, but it, because yeah. it is common with our clients and we'll see it too from agents advertising a listing. So if you're looking at listings as a consumer and somebody says, oh, Bosa built and it gets yes. sort of you really excited that this is quality, understand it's not the developer's fault, but there were some 
some methodologies that were ineffective in the 90s, not just rain screens. So we're not picking on Bosa. They're a good quality builder. Do you want to get into <laughs> to fixes? How so? Uh, yeah, I mean, so we've we've confirmed obviously that the the rain screen problem still exists, and we've mentioned there can be a low risk building, me- medium risk, high risk. Yeah. They're not all not they're not building like buildings that are being built right now because the code has changed to this rain screening technology. Um, they're not you know it's not really an issue with them still being you know being built, um, but there are ones that haven't been fixed. Maybe maybe on the note of fixes, just before we get into the different methods, let's talk a little bit about the partial rain screen. And we hinted at it a bit when we were talking about the building that shall not be named. Yeah. But And that's band aid, not partial. Right. Um but what about partial rain screens? What are your guys' thoughts? There's one in town um that we all we all know that has had partial and it was I mean Matt, was it would you say eighty percent was rain screened? Or is it even Well there's a number of buildings that are partial, so I'm not quite sure which one you're talking about. Uh, on the key. The recent one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, probably eighty sit fair. Yeah. So they went in and had a company come and, and you know measure moisture levels um, and they were able to say you are not having issues in these areas. Like certain targeted areas. Not not I would say targeted, but it was it was it's this whole wall sort of system is okay. Right. Okay. It's got a sufficient overhang or it's facing west, so it gets lots of sun, so it does get to breathe and dry. Yeah. Those types of characteristics. And they'll say, yeah, repeatedly over and over it tests as dry, functional. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like the the term partial because I mean we've got some that have someone could say partial for the other one that we're not naming. Um even though it's just in little sections, yeah. What is partial band, mean, as band aids, right? right? So unless it, for me as a buyer, for me representing my buyers, unless I can see that a report that says we looked into it, we found that these were the areas that had the issues, and these are the ones we targeted. Not holy crap, rain screening is really expensive. Can we just do a little bit now, and then we'll deal with the rest later? Right, that's but it's a not bad money partial. saving issue. Well, and lenders right. notice that too. The the only building I can think of offhand where I'm like, oh yeah, that made total sense was when one material wasn't present throughout the whole building. I'm I'm thinking of one of the tower, one of the very early towers down at the key. They were worried about weight, is my understanding, and they yeah. they didn't allow the entire building to be solid concrete. There's one wall that is EFIS, I believe. Two, yeah, two on the back. Yeah, and yeah. and they had to they brain screened that portion, but well, not the concrete part. That makes sense. That's a really good example because there's two, they're sister buildings, and yeah. one has rain screened the back, and one has has gone with uh, another fix. Oh, what a great segue! Yeah, to, wow, uh, Jeff, that <laughs> might be your best transition ever. Woo. I've been I've been working on uh, my segues at, at home. Um, so rain screening they came up with in let's say early two thousands as a uh, we need to address this issue with the water late late nineties I believe Nin- yeah ninety eight build- or ninety nine I think is the is the, it wasn't uh, it wasn't building code though until uh, ninety eight. Yeah. And are you sure? Yep. I, I, the only reason I know is because I lived down at the Key when I was in high school. We moved by the time I was out of high school, and I remember the, rain, the tarps going up on yeah. a few of them. My, my, my place that I, my first place I lived at, that was a 98, 99 construction, and all of it was done. Just, just because it's being done, it, it existed, but it wasn't necessarily code. No, it was late 90s. It, I'm going to check. But there's I'll some, the there some transitional going on, though. Like, you, you, you're right. It, it was it, modified. It, yeah, and that the people were discovering it, but most built at like 98, 99 is going to be built with rain screen. That's an early phase rain screen style. Anyway. So they came up with this way to, 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 I mean, we haven't even gone into that too much, but basically a second layer of protection where you've got an air gap in between these two these two systems. So if water does get in, it can run out, um, and it also allows air. So if, if water is, if you have moisture condensation within the walls because of dew points and things like that, that can that can breathe as well. Um, and, and I mean, and there's still people out there that, that think that it's a bit overkill, um, that if you did have water that snuck behind, you wouldn't be able to tell that there was an issue until it sort of presented itself inside the unit. Cause there's no, you've got this like shield almost, um, out, out in front. So, and then I guess more, I don't know if it was more recently, but, um, they came up, they've got some, some paint products that it's not rain screening cause you're literally, literally just applying this paint and, and doing caulking and things like that. Um, but it was, a, it's a breathable paint that's supposed to allow. 
Are we talking about the Elastomeric? Elastomeric, yeah. I don't know if that's a brand of paint. Um, yeah. If there's different kinds, but um, they were able to come up with a, a paint. Base. Well, in the style there is that it's, it's rubberized or elasticized so that if there are cracks in the wall, the paint itself yeah. covers those cracks. And they've got decent warranties with it. It's not the same warranty as, as you would get with, you know, with the, the rain screening uh, system. Um, but it seems to, to be working on the buildings that, that, that have, have it. Um, I don't, and I don't even know if I have an opinion on, on whether this is a very controversial section of what we're talking about here is the elastomeric solution. I was really hard on it early in my career because it was, it was new. It was a relatively young product and I wasn't sure if I could stand behind the longevity of it. Well, the, the inspectors were really down on it. I feel like inspectors are not as hard on it now as they were maybe even five years ago. Yeah, it's amazing how just time and proof of concept yeah. can change opinions. Uh, so buildings now that have elastomeric paint, we seem to to be reasonably okay with as yeah. medium to low risk. Yeah, we still do our due diligence with buyers and we'll look in and be like, what kind of, you know, do we have ingress issues that are happening? Like maybe this was done five years ago, um, but it's still an important thing that we, you know, we all raise to our clients, right? That, yeah. You know, it was was built in the time. They had some issues. This is how they resolved it. It was a more cost-effective way of resolving it, and it seems to be working. And this is the example with the two towers that you were... Yeah. Your amazing so going transition. Back to, going <laughs> back to that in a really, you know, roundabout way. Um, one of the backsides was done with the paint, and, your, and I don't know, in terms of percentage-wise, it's... Uh, maybe like 30% of the building yeah. um, on a, on a North facing. So less, less exposure to the elements. Uh, one building rain screen and one did the paint. And as far as I know, both were, both were working. One probably saved some money. One thing people should know is even though we can't really speak to whether the elastomeric will stand the test of time as a buyer, you should be aware that the banks don't love it. I I've encountered problems with financing um, especially people who have less than 20% down and have to get insured by CMHC uh, going through elastomeric paint. Now, not every bank, like we've, we've found, but some of them, some of them are pretty cautious still. Yeah. I don't know because you never don't necessarily know, like there's, there's deals that finance in these buildings. You don't necessarily know the particulars of yeah. their, their financial situation. Um and sometimes it's just a matter of updating the banks need updated information or the insurers, CMHC and, um, and so on. They, they just needed updated information that, that no, it was addressed. And I find a lot of times when they, when the initial discovery is made that there's some water ingress, moisture issues, leaks, whatever you want to call them, um, they get a proper engineering company to come in and it's what's in that report as being the suggested yes. fix. And if the suggested fix is, is, black and white, this needs rain screen, they will not budge on that um, if they have a they, fine. They being like the lender. The lenders, the insurance insurance companies, until they have a piece of paper, and they deal in black and whites, until they have a piece of paper that says a uh, certificate of completion saying that what was said in the engineer's report was in fact done, they won't, they won't touch it. Yeah, you need a recommendation for the work that you chose to do. Mm-hmm. And, we see, and we see both. Like We see some of them that... that they're just plagued because of that report and there's nothing they can do until they actually get a new report yeah. that does its own discoveries and comes and again, get the one that did the other building that we talked about. They might just pass it and it's fine. Um, but they need that. They need that information. Yeah. It's a tough couple of years there as you go through that, that growing pain, right? So what we've noticed is any build, we understand the construction methodology from that era that says it's going to need some sort of improvement on its exterior waterproofing. Possible remedies are full rain screen, and we saw a number of those in the 90s. We haven't seen one recently, really. Mind you, there's one happening on Mowat Street. Its time came up. Mm -hmm. Um, And there may be another one or two happening in town. Um, So the other remedies are partial rain screen, like you talked about, Jerry, where Mm -hmm. 75 to 85% of the building is done, and the engineers say that's okay. Another one is elastomeric paint or something to that effect, continuous monitoring, caulking, making sure that no water gets in. So that's kind of taking the try to keep it 100% waterproof method. Yeah. Are there any other remedies that we haven't mentioned? Stick your head in the sand. They, oh yeah, there's that one. <laughs> yeah. There are still some of those out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we don't get an engineer's report, there isn't a problem. <laughs> yeah, ignore. Um, and that works. Green <laughs> green well, tarps. Buy, buyers don't me- notice. Buyers' agents who aren't educated like we are don't notice. The banks, if it's not documented, yeah. they don't notice. 
You can get away yes. with it for a while. For a while. <laughs> I think a good you mentioned Moet, which I think is is kind of an interesting one. Um, that's an earlier '80s building we're talking about yep. with cedar cladding. So cedar and and these buildings are all over the place. And and you're like, well, that doesn't have overhangs either. Like typically that style. You're talking about like a four four story low rise condominium wood wood frame building. Um, and they just and and so with that one, they they left some of those repairs to the exterior. I wouldn't necessarily call it a leaky condo, although there was rotting boards. And mm-hmm. if you let your exterior rot, water's going to get in. Um, but for that example, in, in those buildings, and not a lot of buildings might not know this, but if you leave your exterior maintenance too too long and they, and they deem that, hey, we're actually going to have to replace a bunch of your siding, it's possible that you end up having to do a rain screen. Yeah, you can't re- repair. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of interesting, actually, like... When the leaky condo crisis was at its height, the government of Canada came out with their recommendations for who needs rain screening. And basically, for the low rises, everybody, unless they were vinyl, uh, vinyl exterior, they were like, yeah, you're going to have to rain screen. And we've been talking a lot about stucco as the big culprit, but it's not the only culprit by Mm -hmm. any means. And I guess vinyl kind of naturally pushes that water out. Anyway. It, well, it's got air flowing behind. Right. It's, That's it's, the a, it's loose fitting. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then like what Jerry's saying about this wood siding is it's building code. Yeah. So it's not that you actually have a leaky condo methodology. It's kind of like if you want to renovate your kitchen and you gut it and you pull a permit. Now you got to do the new rules. Yeah. You have to follow yeah. the new rules and the new rules are, are rain screen. So that's how sort of Moet ended up with that sort of exponentially large bill. Right. Uh, is how that happened there, right? So we've outlined a uh, low, medium, high risk. Yeah. We know what's out there. If people are looking, buyers, they're wondering, am I in a building maybe that's riskier than I thought when I went into it? Um, what can we sort of summarize for this for people listening, watching? What do they need to be on the lookout for? Yeah, I, I, I think if you're a buyer, I mean, obviously you need to read all the reports and engineers' reports. You need to think about Jair's talking about you know the time frame uh no overhangs all of that one thing i always tell brand new buyers is if it's a 90s or mid to late 80s building you want to look in between the floors on the exterior of the building and see if you can spot flashing running by now not every building needs it but if you see those strips of flashing they didn't do that in like that's not construction styles in 1992. Yeah, the EFIS walls will be will be really flat. Yeah. Um, and you'd really have like little expansion joints and things that'll just be sort of cocked. You might see a little bit of a yeah. ridge, but the flashings that Jeff's talking about, yeah, they're they're metallic. They're flashings, easy to spot. Yeah. Um, under windows and and uh, but and you have to be careful like because certain buildings that we've talked about, like one of them has done one wall and it just happens to be the front wall, so you see it. <laughs> and it, you're like, oh, this building looks like it's been updated. But if you walk around the whole thing, yeah, not so much. So the era, when was it built? Yeah. Um, physically, like we all we all do that when we're when we're seeing these buildings. Like we'll, you know, somebody emails us a, some, a listing and you're like, let me check into that. We'll try and look at the pictures. Sometimes you can't quite tell. You actually need to go and, and have a look. Um, but certainly that's a, a good start. Well, and often when you see a condo building that seems disproportionately lower priced than the rest in town. There's a you, reason. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. That might be the reason why. What a deal. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I've, you, typically we have a lot of first time buyers who discover that. They email us and they say, hey, I love this one. And you say, yes. Here, here's the reason why. Right. It's pretty. It's, we know it off the top of our heads. There's a couple of buildings in town that I was told about at the beginning of my career to the point that I've never actually stepped foot in them. Mm. Just there's been no need. Because we just know they're high risk, right? So people need to look out for this. Uh, we're recording this show today in 2019, five years from now in 2024. Is this still a talking point? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. As long as the buildings are still standing. Yeah. You can put your head in the sand for a long time. Well, and, and you know, Matt, you mentioned in New West that we haven't seen many buildings rain screen lately. Outside of New West in the Lower Mainland, you see tarps go up all the time. There's a this is a a very real problem throughout the entire Lower Mainland. Yeah, so it could be still decades going on as these buildings are still standing. To continue to stand, they're going to need a more aggressive fix. So it's it's going to be a talking point for many years to come, even though we're coming up on thirty years. Yeah, yeah. and it doesn't always necessarily mean you don't buy it. There, there's some factors and some conversations that we need to ha- we need to have with people with our clients, um, so they're making you know the informed decision because it's 
not necessarily a no. Um, but there's a, there's a lot be. to know. So you're starting off at the right place listening to this show, but you need some expert opinions, agents, inspectors, different resources to help you out if, this, if you're really considering a uh, product from that, that era. So that wraps it up as a good uh, summary, what to look out for, why do they still exist, what is a leaky condo. Hope this has been helpful. Jeff? Yes, Jeff. Yes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it was helpful. <laughs> I thought, Jeff, you would like to uh, wrap us up because I think we're wrapped. Yeah, that's that's going to be our show for the day. Um, thank you for checking it out. Uh, I've been Jeff McLennan, and you can find me at realestatenewwest.com. Uh, with me is Matt Brabens and Jeremy Ray, and you can always find them at thenewwestguys.com. If you're enjoying the show, please leave us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And, if you got uh, questions about leaky condos, if you got questions, send them to us. Yeah, wait, you want to know what building we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a not, trap. <laughs> it's, it's not your building. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got email, so you can email that. Yep, the email address is feedback at morealestateshow dot com. And next week, oh, we're going to be talking to a home inspector, so we can even yeah, if you do have questions, we can kind of get into that. A bit too. I'm sure he's got some horror stories and things he can tell us about. All right. Thanks, cool. guys. Thanks. We, we went that whole show without mentioning any buildings by name. We did it. <laughs> That's. It was hard. I felt like it was difficult to. I I was tripping over like in my brain. Yeah, like, it was really because well, uh, you never censor when you're talking to a client. No, we're with, not scared to tell them what we think. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so that's good. And because we're doing these Facebook Live things, uh, we also can't edit <laughs> <laughs> after. Goodbye, Facebook Live. After after the fact. Are we, are we saying bye to the Facebook people? Well, I think Matt just cut the feed, maybe? No, I didn't, because there's a question. Oh, well, well we got you here. What'd we get? Uh, David is saying that when I rented, I was in a leaky condo. It was six months under the tarps, one month without windows. <laughs> Burr. It was not fun, but the rent was cut in half, so that was okay. Uh, going through it certainly made me extra diligent when I bought a place, though. So that's a comment from David Brebner, which is greatly appreciated. It does remind you that, like we talked about, the option to buy in to a leaky condo, knowing that there is some risk. Maybe you can yeah. pay for it. There's a benefit, obviously. The value of the building should go up in the future. Right. But it, it is not enjoyable not living fun. in there oh, during. Yeah. 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 Thanks, David. We'll reply to your comment uh, in post, as Jeff says. <laughs> <laughs> cool, guys. Good show. Good job. <laughs>